It's just a refreshing and blessed morning of worship and music, focusing on God as our Creator. That is the subject that I want to speak to you about this morning in our look at the Word of God. Over the weekend uh, of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, we took a look at Romans chapter 5 and we talked about Adam and the reign of death and Christ and the reign of life. We uh, on Friday night, particularly at our Good Friday service, talked about how that Adam fell and uh, tore the whole human race down from its place of innocence and glory into corruption and sin, and as a result, death followed. In thinking about that, I thought it might be helpful to us to go back, even before the fall, back to the very beginning and talk a little bit about the theology of creation itself. So I want you to open your Bible to the first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to listen as I read this chapter to you and a couple of verses into chapter 2. Familiar in general to us, but listen specifically to the words as they are the very words of God Himself, the only one who was there at creation, who has given us His own account of what He did, and then by the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write them down accurately. This is God's own declaration concerning creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, "'Let there be light,' and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day." Then God said, "'Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters.' God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day." Then God said, "'Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so.'" God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters He called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, "'Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them.' And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good." There was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Then God said, "'Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for the lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth.' And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, "'Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens.'" God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, "'Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth.'" There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, "'Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind.' And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, 
Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth." God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created him, male and female He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was morning, and there was evening, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done." That is a very clear presentation of creation. I want to talk about that this morning, but I don't want to talk about it in some polemical way. This isn't a, an argument or a defense of Scripture. This is a declaration of the truth for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of worship. To deny God any place in His creation that He deserves is to strip Him of glory and worship. That is a very serious act. We are warned in the Ten Commandments not to take the name of the Lord in vain, not to do anything that diminishes His honor and His glory. Taking away the glory that belongs to Him as the Creator is taking His name in vain. It is diminishing Him and it strikes a blow against the worship that He deserves. Now let me just remind you that the Bible is history. The Bible is history. And where there is poetry, it rehearses history in a poetic sense, such as in the Psalms. The Bible is not theory, it is not myth. As such, it is history, it is fact, it is reality, it is truth. And what I just read you is the only account of creation that exists. And it is the creation account from the only one who was there, the Creator. That's very important to understand. The Bible bases all its truth on history, not on myth and not on fantasy, but on history. When it comes to origins and considering how the universe came into existence, this is all we have, this is all we need. Now let me approach it a different way. Whoever created the universe, we'll create a hypothetical, whoever created the universe and everything that is in it understands it, would you agree? Whoever created it understands it. Whoever has the wisdom, intelligence, and power to create the universe and all that is in it understands it perfectly, understands every minute aspect of it, and is not waiting for man to advance scientifically to explain to him what happened. Since the Creator designed it and created it and sustains it, he understands it. He knows that the earth is spherical, not flat, that it turns on an axis, is not static, that it is suspended on nothing, that it sweeps through space in a fixed rotation and a fixed orbit in its own solar system and at the same time is dragged 
by the center of this solar system, the sun, through the entire space as the whole orbiting set of planets and sun that we know has an orbit of its own that runs from one end of heaven to the other. Whoever made this knows that. And that's why he says in Psalm 19 that the sun has an orbit from one end of heaven to the other. Whoever made the world as we know it and the universe knows the galaxies. He knows the staggering reaches of space and the countless stars and galaxies. He knows them all, made every one of them, so He knows them. He knows their components. He knows their location. He knows their movement. Whoever made this planet knows the cycles of air and water. He knows the facts of chemistry and biology physiology. He understands atomic structure. So we would assume that whoever made this, if He were to give us a description that we could understand of His creative act, would get it right. And that's exactly what you have in Genesis 1 and expanded upon in Genesis 2. What the Creator tells you about creation is exactly what happened. He is the Creator, after all. He knows. And by the way, whoever, hypothetically still, is intelligent enough and powerful enough to design, create, and then sustain the incalculable complexity of the universe and all life that is in it is certainly intelligent enough to do the relatively simple task of authoring an accurate account of His creation. If the Creator wrote down His creation and how it was done, it would be reality. And if the Creator always spoke the truth, if the Creator is truth and cannot lie, then all the more are we to trust what He said. And only the Creator could give us this information, and no one could know if it was accurate or not by any observable means or any repeatable means, or therefore any scientific endeavor. No one was alive until the sixth day. The only account we have is the one by the author of Scripture who is the Creator. And oh, by the way, whoever created the universe would not say the moon is 50,000 leagues higher than the sun and has its own light. He would not say the earth is flat and triangular composed of seven stages, one of honey, one of sugar, one of butter, and one of wine. Nor would He say that the earth sits on the heads of countless elephants who produce earthquakes when they shake. That's what the Hindu holy book says. So we know the Creator didn't write that book. <laughs> Hinduism offers us a ridiculous lie. And oh, by the way, the Hindu Upanishad says, quote, the sun is the source of all energy in the universe. We know that's not true. The Creator would never say there are only 13 members of the body through which death can come, but that's what the Taoist holy book says. So we know whoever wrote that is not the Creator. The Creator would never say that earthquakes are caused by wind moving water and water moving the land. But that's what the Buddhist holy book says, so we know the Creator didn't write that book. 
And oh, by the way, the Creator would never say that Adam fell, that men might come into existence and that they might have joy. But that's what it says in 2 Nephi chapter 2 in the Book of Mormon. So we know God didn't write that book. Also says in the Book of Mormon, Alma 710, that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. The Creator would never write that. He would know Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. Whoever created the universe would not say, man is not made up of matter. He is not a composite of brain and blood and bones and other material elements. And man is incapable of sin, sickness, and death. That's what is in the Science and Health and Key to the Scriptures in the Christian Science Holy Book, which is neither Christian or science. It is like grape nuts. They aren't grapes and they aren't nuts. <laughs> so that's enough to make the point. We know that the Creator didn't write any of those books. If we have a divine Creator, and we do, and He is a communication genius, and He is holy and true, then we assume that when He says, this is the account of creation, that we can take Him at His word. It's so interesting to me that Genesis 1 is not muddled, it's not confusing, it's crystal clear, because the true Creator is infinitely intelligent, but He can reduce His intelligence down to logical, clear information and communicate it. He can do that all the way down to the nucleus of a cell, which operates because it is encoded with communication. This communication in the, the macrocosm is what causes all the bodies in the universe to move inexorably on a defined orbit. The whole universe and all that exists in the universe depends on the information from this divine information genius. We would expect then, if information is His thing and He's absolutely true, that He would give us true information about creation and not say absolutely absurd and ridiculous, if not idiotic things. And so when we come to origins and we want to understand creation, we can only go to the account that He has given us in Genesis 1. And if you want a summary of Genesis 1, try Exodus 20.11, which says, in six days He made everything. In six days He made everything. And to let you know they were days, they are numbered and even identified as a morning and an evening. Scripture opens, in fact, if you go back to Genesis 1-1, with a really astounding statement. On the surface, it's very simple, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But again, this is an illustration of God's communication genius and how He can say everything that needs to be said with an economy of words that is just stunning. It was 1903 when Herbert Spencer, well-known scientist, died. And he had been hailed for his discovery of categories. He had come up with what are the categories of the knowable. He said there are five categories of the knowable. In other words, everything that exists fits into one of these categories. Time, force, action, space, and matter. Everything that exists is within those categories. Time, force, action, space, and matter. Discovery of Herbert Spencer. Look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, that's time, God, that's force, created, that's action, the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. All categories of the knowable are in the very first statement of Scripture. The Bible says that God created everything that exists out of nothing in six days, out of nothing. So nobody gets past the first verse of the Bible without facing the test of submission to God. 
submission to His Word, submission to His authority. This is where we start worshiping Him, right, as Creator. And we don't need to muddy the waters by introducing into this chapter some things that confound its directness and steal worship from our God. So I want to give you three words to think about this morning. Number one word is fidelity. Fidelity, that means loyalty, trustworthy, faithful. Fidelity. Having fidelity to the revelation of God, being faithful to the revelation of God. Either you believe what Scripture says or you don't. I understand that. You can believe it or not believe it. You can accept it or you can reject it, but you cannot alter it. You cannot alter it. You cannot change it. You say, well, what about science? What about science? Don't we have to apply science to the Genesis account to be intellectually honest? Let me tell you something. That is the dumbest thing that anybody ever attempted to do. You say, well, why are you saying that? Because there is no such thing as the science of creation. Did you get that? I know there are organizations called creation science. There is no such thing as creation science. There is no such thing as the science of creation. I want to help to deliver you from needless doubts by saying that. Science came into existence as a result of creation. Science has nothing to say about creation. All science is based on observation, verification by repetition. You observe it, you verify it by repeating it. Creation had no observers. It can't be verified because it can't be repeated. It is not observable. It is not repeatable. It did not happen according to any laws that we know about. It did not happen by a way that is predictable, repeatable, or fixed. In a word, creation was a massive supernatural miracle. And if you just let it be what it is, you're going to get science out of it, and science belongs out of it. There is not in the Genesis account or any other place in Scripture any implicit or explicit reference to this as some kind of poetry, some kind of allegory, some kind of illustration, nor is there anything in this account at all or anywhere else in Scripture that implies any kind of process. This is six days. There is no evolution here. There's only one historical account of creation. I'm happy to say it's from the Creator. This is it. You say, well, wait a minute, don't, 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 don't animals change? Sure, they're changing within species once they're created. Don't plants develop? And Sure, there's all kinds of things that happen once they're created, but observing what happens, we don't see evolution to start with, but even if we did, we can't read it into pre-science and the miracle of creation. What's going on in the world in terms of life says nothing about creation, nothing at all. There is no information about creation that is scientific. There is only the testimony of the Creator, and this is a miracle beyond imagination. And we read the New Testament and we say, isn't it wonderful when Jesus healed somebody? That's a miracle. But that miracle, that miracle literally is a tiny piece of sand on the sands of the earth compared to the massive miracle of creation. Trying to read science into creation, trying to read science into a miracle is really impossible. Go to the Old Testament. You remember the story about the axe head that floated? What's the scientific explanation? There is no scientific explanation. Axe heads can't float. That's a miracle. Or the sun standing still. What's the scientific explanation? Oh, the scientific explanation is the earth stopped rotating. 
You can't explain that scientifically. What's the scientific explanation for God parting the Red Sea? There is no scientific explanation for that, and then folding it back over to top of Pharaoh and his armies. What's the scientific explanation of Jesus walking up to the tomb in John 11 and saying, Lazarus, come forth? Do you want to explain that scientifically? What, what, what happened to him? You have a scientific explanation of how a guy who's been dead for days and already stinketh, as it says, all of a sudden walks out of a grave? Or maybe you'd like to give us a scientific explanation of Jesus creating fish and bread, bread that came from no grain and was in no oven and fish that didn't have a mama and daddy fish. <laughs> How do you explain it? What is the scientific explanation? The point is there is no scientific explanation. If there's a scientific explanation, it's not a miracle. You have to see creation as a miracle. And you have, and I'm so thankful you do, the record of the Creator who did the miracle. Now, if you like, you can choose Charles Darwin. You can let him be your God. You can deny the God of the Bible his place, and you can make Charles Darwin your God. And you'll have a lot of company, or you'll have a lot of highbrow company, since Charles Darwin's view dominates 99 percent of the universities in America and 99.9 percent of the universities in Europe. In the last decade, 93 percent of the National Science Academy members were self-described atheists, 93 percent. 98.7 of evolutionary biologists are atheists. Does it make sense to be an atheist, to believe that nobody times nothing equals everything? Does that make sense? You're, 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 you're a professor where? You have a Ph.D. in what? No, moving from God to Charles Darwin is an apostasy from the Christian faith. It follows not the influence of Darwin primarily, but it follows the influence of Rousseau, Descartes, Marx, Nietzsche, John Dewey, and humanism. It is a philosophy. Evolution is the product of the developing philosophy of atheistic humanism that needs to get rid of God and then explain what can't be explained. Apostate science looking for pseudo-reasons to reject Christianity and the God of the Bible. It is not motivated by the intellect, it is motivated by immorality. You go back and you read about Rousseau, Descartes, Marx, Nietzsche, and those, you will read of the most black, wicked, wretched, immoral, dissolute, depraved, debauched lives. They came up with a philosophy that would eliminate God so they could live the way they wanted to live, and once God was eliminated, then somebody had to come up with a way to explain the universe, and now there was an apostasy from the Christian faith. Charles Darwin was the devil's agent, and so he came up with a convenient explanation for the universe for an apostate world. They all know that if God can be separated from origins, if God can be separated from creation, then he can be separated from morality, he can be separated from ethics, he can be separated from behavior. And if God is separated from ethics and morality and behavior, then there is no ultimate judge of our behavior. There's no sin, there's no guilt, there's no judgment, there's no punishment to fear. Live any way you want to live. And that's how those philosophers lived and that's how Darwin lived. Free to live any way you want. There's no Creator. So make your choice. You want to worship God, holy, omniscient, true, or do you want to worship Charles Darwin, who is the stooge for atheistic humanism? By the way, Charles Darwin was a very strong advocate for eugenics and genocide. He was a twisted individual by all accounts. One of his biographers says, by his own admissions, he was a sadist 
and he took great enjoyment in torturing and killing animals, especially loved to kill birds by pounding on their heads with a hammer. From the time he was seventeen years old, he dedicated his summers and autumns to killing animals, not for the meat but for the sheer delight of killing. While in our day, this biographer says, this might bother a member of PETA, it should be particularly troublesome to the Christian who believes Proverbs 12.10, the righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And by the way, as he made his plans uh, for the voyage on the Beagle where he was supposed to be discovering these evolutionary things, Darwin included several guns in hopes that he might, quote, be able to kill some cannibals. Even as a child, he would beat puppies simply from enjoying the sense of power. Entire books have been written on the subject of Darwin's psychological problems. Listen to this. He suffered from depression, agoraphobia, that's fear of crowds, insomnia, vision alterations, hallucinations, malaise, vertigo, shaking, tachycardia, fainting spells, shortness of breath, trembling, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, muscle twitches, spasms, tremors, cramps, colics, bloating, headaches, nervous exhaustion, skin blisters, tinnitus, and sensations of loss of consciousness and impending death. According to Darwin's own testimony, his problems began at sixteen years of age, and by the time he was twenty-eight, he was virtually incapacitated by mental illnesses. These maladies were so chronic that Darwin's scholar Michael Roos concluded that he lived as an invalid for the last forty-three years of his life. You don't assault God and get away with it. Contemporary atheists confirm that the road to atheism always begins in a biology class with Charles Darwin, and it always appeals to sinners running away from God, running in the direction of their lusts and sin. Creation cannot be understood any other way than by believing the revelation of the Creator. If you want to choose Charles Darwin, you can have him. But Charles Darwin is not a hermeneutic to interpret Genesis 1 and 2. Creation, as I said, has no connection to science as we know science. Science as a reality was created by God at the creation. Science is simply the observation of the way things are, and they are the way they are because He created them that way in six days. You can't explain to somebody the science of the resurrection of Lazarus, the science of the bread and the loaves, the science of an axe head that floats, the science of the parting of the Red Sea. It has no scientific explanation. The miracle of creation is just the most massive of all miracles. It is not explicable by any observable, repeatable, fixed laws. So all you're left with is fidelity to accept the truth, believe the truth, be faithful to it. Somebody says, well, couldn't God have used evolution? That question is intrusive, irritating, and irrelevant. If you want an answer, He did not. He did not. He made everything in six days. Why are you questioning what God has said? If God came to you and said, I made everything in six days, what would you say to Him? Well, now, now listen, God, uh, uh, there are some things you need to know about science. <laughs> listen, you've been answered. Turn to Job 38. Turn to Job 38. This is a, this is a wonderfully important portion of Scripture. Job has been having some trouble, and uh, he's trying to sorted out, and he's got some friends who aren't much help, and collectively they, they're questioning God. I love the Lord's answer, chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? What a great statement. You're not helping. You're just making it worse. All right, gird up your loins like a man. And I will ask of you, you instruct me. You love the sarcasm of that? Are you going to tell me? Gird up your loins like a man and tell me. By the way, verse 4, where were you when I laid 
the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know, who stretched the line on it? And what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, the angels? And who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb and I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors and I said, thus far you shall come but no farther and here shall your proud wave stop. Where were you when I made the seas and set their shores? Oh, by the way, verse 12, have you ever in your life commanded the morning? Have you ever done that? Or caused the dawn to know its place? Verse 16, have you entered into the springs of the sea and walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this." I mean, this is absolutely God shutting the mouth of anybody who argues with a creation account. Oh, by the way, verse 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light? Where did I find that? Where did that come from? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, and then you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then and the number of your days is great. You must know this, you're sixty-four years old <laughs> or whatever number. By the way, have you entered the storehouses of the snow in verse 22 and seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for the time of distress? And by the way, verse 24, where is the way that the light is divided or the east wind scattered on the earth? Or who left a who cleft a channel for the flood and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people and a desert without a man in it? And then in verse 31, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? He's getting into the constellations. Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bearer with her satellites? Can you lift up your voice, verse 34, to the clouds, tell the clouds to rain, send forth lightnings? Who has put wisdom, verse 36, in the innermost being given understanding to the mind of man? Chapter 39, verse 1, he keeps going. Do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Can you, do you observe the calving of the deer, count the months, etc., etc.? Have you determined the gestation period, the pregnancy period for animals? And he goes through all these animals. And by now, th this, this should be enough. And it is. Chapter 40, yeah, he says, Verse 2, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Speak. You want to argue with me? Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth, which is a nice, nice way of saying, I'm shutting up. Verse 6, the Lord says, answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird up your loins like a man, I will ask you, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like His? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Get a Ph.D. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. Look on everyone who is proud and so forth and so forth. Who in the world do you think you are? Put your hand over your mouth. You can't argue with God about creation, certainly not from a scientific standpoint. There's no science in creation. Creation created the laws that we call science. And besides, to be an atheist, even believing in evolution, is like mental suicide. How could you possibly believe that personality comes out of non-personality, complexity comes out of simplicity, and simplicity comes out of nothing? And how can you give yourself a degree? Romans 1, professing yourself to be wise, you've just become an absolute fool. 
Remember the story of the emperor's new clothes? You think you're dressed and you're naked. Well, some of these scientists now, some of these atheistic scientists are beginning to realize that they've got to come up with something else other than sheer random evolution. So they come up with what they call ID, intelligent design. They don't want to say who the intelligence is because that, they don't want to get to the biblical God, but it seems as though there's some intelligence out there. That, that's, that's a big leap. You, you would think that would be the most obvious thing that any scientist would ever come up with. They don't want to say it's God, but it's becoming overwhelmingly clear as we now get into electron microscopy and get down to the very tiniest part components that make up life, that the complexity and the information coding is so sophisticated that the the, the idea of randomness is just completely insane, but still an unwillingness to embrace God. So for us, look, we want to worship God, right? As Creator, we need to start with fidelity, trust in Scripture. We contacted a national ministry, and I'll quickly add this. We contacted a national ministry claiming to be Bible-based, and they say they are, Christ-proclaiming, gospel-centered, a letter to the president asking for their position on origins. You'd know this ministry, but I'll spare them the embarrassment. The letter came back and it said this, our ministry takes no stand, we avoid secondary issues. Our efforts are designed to bring people together based on the historically essential doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. Creation is one of those secondary doctrines we believe falls into the category of non-essentials like eternal security. Amazing. Secondary doctrine? God is Creator? I would suggest you ask any so-called Christian ministry, especially a Christian college or seminary or church, what do you believe about Genesis 1 and 2? There are 106 colleges in this association in America, the Christian College Coalition. We think five of them believe in the Genesis account. Over 100 do not. That's all you need to hear before you decide where to send your young person. So fidelity. I'm going to give you a second word. I'll have to do this quick because we're running out of time. Second word is simplicity. And I don't need to say much about it. Simplicity. The Genesis account, by all honest considerations, is very simple, very plain, very clear, very perspicuous, very uncomplicated, and unmistakable. We teach that account to little children, don't we? Nothing complicated about it. It's not poetry. It is not Hebrew poetry. It isn't structured that way in its original language. It is a simple account of creation. John 1 says that the Word was made. The the Word uh, was God, the Word made everything that is, and without Him nothing was made that was made. He is the Creator. That's what Colossians 1 says, that's what it says throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy 4.32 talks of the day that God created man on the earth. Isaiah 40.28, do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, doesn't become weary or tired, He's the Creator of the ends of the earth. Isaiah 42, many Scriptures, I don't have time to give them to you. One Scripture I do want to call to your attention is in the book of Revelation, it's in chapter 14, because I think we need to remember this in the, um, in the, in the time in the future when heaven itself de- preaches the gospel. Heaven itself will preach the gospel. Right now we're the preachers of the gospel, men and women on earth, but heaven one day will preach the gospel. In Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. This is during the time of the tribulation having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here's the gospel, the gospel that heaven itself preaches. And here is what the angel says with a loud voice, fear God, give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of waters. You fear God, you give Him glory, you worship Him as the Creator. Okay, one final word, and I left out all the good stuff. One final word, priority, priority. What do I mean by that? What is the reason for the creation? What is God's priority in His creation? What's His purpose? Why did God create this entire world. Listen to Ephesians 3, verse 9, 
Here's the answer, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Why? So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenlies. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which He carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord." Do you understand what you just heard? He created all things so that He might, through the church, manifest His glory to the angels in accordance with His eternal purpose. What's His eternal purpose? The whole creation exists so that God can redeem humanity, take His redeemed church to heaven, and by that redeemed church give testimony to the angels of His mercy and grace and redemption. All of creation exists so that God could redeem sinners to take them to heaven for His own eternal glory. And by the way, when He's done with that redemption, when redemption is complete, He will destroy the whole universe. The Old Testament says it, the New Testament says it, the book of Revelation describes it, Second Peter describes it in detail. The elements will melt with fervent heat. There will be an atomic implosion of the whole creation. We're not responsible to take care of the planet in that sense. It's a disposable planet. If you think we're messing it up, wait till you see what Jesus does to it. <laughs> it is a disposable planet. We're not here to preserve the planet. We're here to proclaim the gospel. It will not end until it's God's time to end it. His purpose will be accomplished, He says in Isaiah, and when that's done, it will go out of existence and He will create a new heaven and a new earth. Give Him glory as the Creator and understand that He's established this creation as a place where He can redeem His people for His own eternal glory. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank You for this time together this morning, such wonderful and encouraging truth that has been brought to us by Your faithful Word. We're so thankful that we don't have to struggle to understand reality because it's all disclosed for us in Your precious Word. We worship You as our great Creator. We worship You as the author of Scripture. We worship You as the Redeemer, the Savior who created this entire universe to put on display Your glory and then to even enhance Your glory by redeeming us to take us to heaven, to display to the angels, the eternal holy angels, Your majesty and Your glory as demonstrated through Your grace and mercy, something angels never did experience. But they will, along with us, praise You for it forever. We worship You as our Creator our Redeemer, the author of history and the consummator of history, the one who will bring it to pass because You have said it, You will bring it to pass. To that end, we pray for Your glory. In Christ's name, amen.